morning, everybody. We'd like to call to order uh, the, the uh, September 25th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Just note that Supervisor Caput is in route. He's just uh, on Highway 1, but he will be here. So if we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. McPherson. Friend. Here. And if you could all join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Do we have any changes to today's agenda? Uh, there's just one revision on the consent agenda, item number 14. There's additional materials. There was a strategic plan uh, poster um, that was not included in the original agenda that we're including now. Thank you. We're now going to open it up to the community. This is an opportunity for uh, public comment. This is for items that are on the consent agenda, items that are not on today's agenda, or uh, items that, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, as well as items on our regular agenda. If you're unable to stay for the regular agenda item, this is your opportunity to speak. You'll have three minutes uh, to address us on those items. Feel free to step forward. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, my name is Jeffrey Ellis. I uh, live in the first district where I've lived for uh, more than 30 years. And I'm here to uh, address the board on um, item 16 on the consent agenda, which is the um, shelter crisis. Um, clearly, you need to pass some kind of resolution like this in order to uh, access state funds to construct uh, homeless shelters. However, um, passing the proposed ordinance would uh, completely waive state housing codes uh, that apply uh, to the construction of these shelters. Um, a as you know, state housing codes provide the most basic requirements for housing. Uh, there has to be plumbing, there has to be heating. <laughs> there has to be uh, a, a way to exit uh, quickly in case of fire, things like this. Um, under Senate Bill 850, you can elect uh, not to waive these requirements and you can still get the money. And my request is that you uh, consider that. Um, more, more fundamentally, um, I mean, the consent agenda is for items that do not reflect policy decisions, but you really have important policy decisions here. Uh, not just are you going to waive the code, but which codes are you going to waive? What are you going to do when the shelter crisis uh, comes to an end and you have substandard buildings? Are they going to be upgraded? Are they going to be demolished? Uh, are they going to be grandfathered in? Um, so my request then is to uh, remove this item from consideration for today, uh, refer it to staff for recommendations uh, on the policy questions. I believe you've got uh, plenty of time uh, to apply for the state funds. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Board of Supervisors and Santa Cruz County. Um, my name is Jimmy Cook. I'm the program director at Casa of Santa Cruz. And I'm here specifically to celebrate and thank our former executive director, Cynthia Drulli. Um, Casa of Santa Cruz, Casa stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And we train and recruit and supervise volunteers in our community to work with children in the foster care system and under supervision of the dependency court. Um, Cynthia worked with CASA for over six and a half years steadily and during her time with CASA of Santa Cruz we were able to increase our budget by about 50 percent, our staff by about 25 percent, 
and we were able to assign volunteers work with kids in the dependency court system. Uh, during that time, I think we served over 700 new children. Um, it was quite impressive. She did a lot of advocacy in the community as well, helping to make sure that our school districts understood the need to help children be successful in school so they can have a chance to be successful in life. Um, so I wanted to welcome Cynthia Drooley here today so she could speak for a second as well. Cynthia. Thank you. Um, my retirement, um, I feel like um, I've retired from CASA, but I'm going to continue to be a champion for CASA in the community. Um, the work that we've uh, done over the past few years um, really has, I think, changed the landscape uh, for children in the foster care community. And I specifically want to thank um, the Board of Supervisors for the support that you've provided over the years and the funding and um, the work that you've done. Um, and also I want to thank Ellen Timberlake and Family and Children's Services and Human Services Department for the partnership that they provided with CASA. Um, we grew quite a bit over the last few years and we ventured into new realms um, supporting infants and toddlers specifically. And in fact, it became the fastest growing program for us in the last couple of years. Um, Lynn Petrovic, um, the new executive director, um, planned to be here today, but she's caught in the traffic coming from South County right now. Um, so I want to welcome her, too, because uh, under her leadership, I know that CASA is going to continue and grow. Um, the work that I did for CASA the last few years um, in my 50 years of working, um, it was the most rewarding work that I ever did in my life. Um, the work um, in working with children in foster care, I think those children are the most needy, um, the most under misunderstood and um, the most neglected. And I think the other thing that was most rewarding for me was the way that the community of Santa Cruz stepped up. Um, the, the work that we did with just uh, 12 staff members, we had 300 volunteers in our community who stepped up. And the work that we did um, required so many people to volunteer and stand side by side with those children every day, two to four hours a week. Um, that really made a difference. And I want to put out one appeal as long as I'm still a cheerleader and ambassador for CASA. Um, the neediest thing that CASA has right now is because we're serving infants and toddlers and working in the homes with children is for Spanish-speaking volunteers. So I'm going to put out that appeal because um, the children who need Spanish-speaking volunteers right now are on the wait list twice as long as any other child. So if people know of volunteers who speak Spanish or people who speak Spanish who might be willing to volunteer, that would be very, very helpful. Um, so I want to thank the Board of Supervisors and I want to thank the community of Santa Cruz for giving me the honor and the privilege of working with CASA and for working in this community for the last 30 years. Um, I love Santa Cruz, um, I've loved working here, and I've loved volunteering here um, as a community member. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Cynthia. And don't leave yet, because the board actually has a, a token of our appreciation for you. We have a proclamation that was done uh, for you by Supervisor Caput, since your, uh, since CASA is located in the 4th District, and Supervisor McPherson, because we understand you're a proud 5th District uh, resident. And we have a couple things in here that I think that the community should hear that was written in this proclamation about some of the remarkable work that you specifically have done in your leadership. First, this wasn't your original career path, which I think that a lot of people don't know, uh, that you had a career path that started in high technology, yeah. and uh, you decided that you wanted to give back in a very unique way, and you've been doing this uh, for quite some time. But, but your contributions here, uh, over the past six years, CASA has steadily increased the number of children served by 10% a year, and last year served 283 children and youth in foster care. Uh, and after your 50 years of working, uh, you plan to spend more time reading, relaxing, and traveling, but this is what I thought was beautiful. After seeing the many beautiful handmade quilts donated to the children at CASA, and they really are quite remarkable, you now aspire to become a quilter, so that you can do the same thing. Uh, on a personal note, I had a close friend of mine that 
volunteered at CASA. She was a local attorney and she passed away. And she had told me that the greatest meaning that she had gotten was her volunteer time at CASA, the work that you do and, and the people that you touch. Um, so we want to present this uh, to you. It's a small token for the remarkable work that you do for um, the youth in our community, but you have left a remarkable legacy and we appreciate your contributions to our local community on this. Thank you. I just want to take a moment and also thank Cynthia and the entire team at CASA and all the volunteers for the extraordinary work you do. It's really uh, the way that we make intergenerational change, the way we improve lives is on a person-by-person -person basis, and cannot, CASA really connects people uh, with, with kids and families when they need it most, and so thank you for your leadership. Uh, I'll also add that, you know, last year the Board of Supervisors held a special meeting at the Museum of Art and History to look at the uh, issues of foster uh, youth. Um, we heard some powerful testimony. It was a very powerful exhibit, uh, which uh, a county staff was involved in, and lots of community members and lots of kids who were involved with CASA uh, were in, involved in. Um, and it really brought home the, the special challenges that that, uh, that young people face who are in the foster care system and the important role that CASA plays. Thank you for your leadership um, and good humor uh, and being a, such a positive ro uh, role model for women um, in leadership positions here in Santa Cruz County. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank you. And uh, I remember when I was on the city council and CASA was going to move into the, uh, uh, the new house there on Freedom Boulevard. And uh, there was opposition at the time from the neighbors. Uh, but when I talk to the neighbors now, you're the most popular uh, uh, neighbor in the whole neighborhood. So, <laughs> people really like having you there. It's, uh, it, you know, thank you for everything you're doing and keep it up. Thank you. We'll continue with public comment. Good morning. Wait, uh, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Of course. Thank you. I'm always happy to recognize people who do good work in the community and volunteer their time. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos. Um, I want to thank the gentleman who stood up first and brought to your attention the seriousness of declaring a crisis, a shelter crisis, in our county and ask, as I did in a very late email last night, that this item be pulled from the consent agenda, put on the regular agenda, or as he suggested, uh, delayed and continued for further study. This is a very significant action and has no place on a consent agenda. Um, under that, uh, it would declare, uh, a, declaring a crisis enables the county to suspend any state or local regulatory statute, regulation, or ordinance prescribing standards of housing, health, or safety to the extent that strict compliance, quote, would in any way prevent, hinder, or delay mitigation of the effects of the shelter crisis, end quote. It enables the county to enact alternative health and safety standards to be operative during the shelter crisis. For this one time, nearly $10 million grant, it has much farther reaching impacts. And as I said in my message to you in the wee hours of this morning, I think we also need to look at how it could impact our county's image for possible uh, financial investors and for tourism. Um, so I want to ask that you pull this item from the consent agenda at the very least and wait until Mr. McPherson gets here to be part of the discussion. I want to bring to your and the public attention Measure G, the proposed half cent sales tax that your board has put on the ballot. The wording for that uh, measure says that it will uh, fund, uh, continue, and I'm reading from the election material, to continue funding 911 emergency response, paramedic, sheriff, fire, 
emergency preparedness, local street repairs, mental health services, homeless programs, parks, economic development, and other general county services. County fire gets no money from the general fund, but you are making it appear with this that money would go to county fire. County fire officials asked Mr. Palacio to put on this November ballot a measure that would have increased county service area 48, the sole mechanism of funding county fire. He pushed it back to April. Now, people will read this and think, oh, this is gonna fund county fire. If this goes through, how will they accept another request in the spring to fund county fire? Because this does not. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name's Elena Brozlovsky, and our son has a serious mental illness. At 16, he attended UC Santa Cruz, being two years ahead of his class. He was a straight-A honor student and lettered athlete. He loved the ocean and received awards for his underwater photography. He loved to snorkel and windsurf. When his illness manifests during his second semester, his personality changed drastically from one who was a serious student, fastidious about his appearance, to a disheveled, ragged, and wild-eyed individual. He left his dorm overlooking the ocean to live on the street. My husband and I have devoted the past 27 years to getting him the best help available with the goal of keeping him out of the criminal justice system. We failed. He has been in and out of school, jail, prison, and the hospital for most of his life. Second story, Peer Respite House, is a quiet, unseen jewel in our community. There are so many unseen ways that it's improving the lives of those with and without mental illness, health challenges. We all see the effects of untreated mental illness on our streets, swelling courtrooms and our jail population. We do not see the effects of those who are saved from this suffering and in turn helping others. Peers are in a unique position to help each other in ways that clinicians can't. We are so lucky to have this entirely peer-run facility in our county. In this case, the most compassionate thing is also the most cost-effective thing. I urge you to take every step possible to protect and promote this precious jewel. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, thank you all for being here. It's good to see you guys again. Um, I'm Jessica Brown and I'm here to ask you guys to find the funds to keep Second Story Respite a residential program. It is a jewel in the community. It does, the people that come through our program are given an opportunity be, to become a part of the community. There's healing, there's health, and people that were on their way to the criminal system, locked institutions, do heal, they give back, and then it is cost effective for our community. These people are not dependent on the resources repeatedly. Um, I just think it's really important that you consider and do everything possible to keep us residential and not community-based. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome Good morning. back. Thank you. My name is Tracy Kennedy, and um, I just wanted to share some information about um, Second Story's um, change over to a community-based um, program. As I speak to more people in the community, the feedback that I'm getting from them is that um, that type of program is not going to offer the support that they need. Um, being able to be in a home 24-7 uh, you know, for, for 14 days really offers more opportunities for them to connect with people and to um, really get the support at the exact time when, when they're needing it, which can be at like 3 in the morning or you know, 12 in, in the afternoon. It really can't be something that's scheduled. You know, we can't schedule a time to go out and meet with someone in their home and have that be a really um, important time for them to be able to connect with someone. 
Um, also, um, my understanding is that it's um, difficult to find us an actual brick and mortar home um, to run that program out of. And um, I think that's an important aspect that needs to be looked at as well. And the difference between the funding for the two programs is um, $300,000. And it seems like if we can get halfway to funding Second Story, then maybe there should be, you know, there's gotta be another way to find the other half of the funding. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Mark Linder. Speaking on behalf of COPA today on item number 17. Item 17 is the proposed three-year pilot program to waive certain fees for ADUs. As an organization that is fighting hard to get more and more housing here, I think this is a great program. As a former retired now city manager, I love three-year pilot projects because they're a way to really test things out and to make adjustments rather than get locked in. So uh, very much support this and hope it goes through today. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank you for your acknowledgement of Cynthia Julie. My wife was on the board for a while and I've been a court appointed special advocate. So it was very nice to see that gesture today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. I'm Gail Pellerin. I'm your county clerk, registrar of voters. And today is National Voter Registration Day. It's the largest one day effort in the United States to register voters out in our communities. Um, we are partnering with the libraries and the, uh, our local Starbucks. So you can read and register at the libraries or drink up democracy at Starbucks. And I want to thank all of our volunteers who are out there registering voters. The deadline to register for the November elections, October 22nd. And just wanted to say, get out there and register. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for your work. work. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. We really do have the best voter registrar in the state <laughs> in so many ways. Um, I'm Betsy Clark. I'm here today in my role as a NAMI board member. And I'm not gonna stand here and tell you how wonderful Second Story is, how awesome, how unique, how cost effective, because you've heard all of that. I'm here to thank you for your patience in listening and engaging on this topic. I think that, um, you know, everyone has been really open to hearing us kind of endlessly. And I don't know if you read all the letters, but I know there's been a lot. So I just wanna thank you for keeping an open mind on this. And I wanna also encourage you to, keep an, to continue to keep an open mind. And as you know, not only we've, people have been sending you letters telling you what a great service it is, you've also got a lot of letters that have to do with like um, ways this can be saved and things that we have you know, looked at and appreciate the fact that you have taken the time to look at some of those and I would just encourage you to do that and hopefully we can find a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Alan Broslovsky. I'm an attorney and I've had the occasion to represent clients in different counties who have had mental health problems. <clears throat> And I have seen that anything we can do to take people out of the criminal justice system and give them the help they need rather than warehouse them is a benefit for this county. It is an excellent return on investment. And the second story, lights need to stay on. Not only to illuminate the rooms, but to act as a beacon for people who need help and who can and will be diverted out of the criminal justice system, which will save this county time, energy, and money. So I urge you, anything that can be done, any agreements, any uh, out-of-the-box thinking that would save this entity would be of great value to this county and of great value to the greater community of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us in the public comment time? Okay, we'll close public comment. We'll bring it to the board for consideration and action on the consent agenda. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Caput. Is there anything you, you would like to discuss on the consent agenda? Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure, uh, I have just a, 
a couple items to discuss and then an additional direction. The first item is uh, number 17, and I want to offer my appreciation to the chair and to the staff for bringing this pilot program forward uh, to reduce fees on ADUs. I think this is an important step we can take among many to uh, increase the supply of uh, housing in our community, especially for wor workforce uh, housing, and so I'm supportive of this effort. Uh, on item number 23, we have a contract with Sobriety Works. This is similar to a contract we had uh, at our last meeting uh, to expand drug Medi-Cal and increase treatment, in our, treatment options in our community. It's absolutely essential that we do this. Um, I'd like to direct HSA to report back on drug Medi-Cal ODS performance measures in a year to include the additional performance measures. That's number one, the number of clients who remain sober six months post-treatment, and two, the number number of nights the residential uh, treatment beds go unfilled. This is the same direction uh, that I gave next week. In the future, if we can just make this a, a, a regular metric that we have um, going forward, I'd appreciate it. But for this particular item, uh, to add these performance measures I'd, would be great. Uh, and then item on number uh, 28, this is Thrive by Three, and I just want to commend Ellen Timberlake and the Human Services Department. They're going after new state home visiting dollars. Uh, this, uh, this is a lot of additional resources for families and babies uh, in our community. It's incredibly important to make that investment as early and it's, um, I just want to note that this is a product of both this county's commitment to this population but also Ellen Timberlake's statewide leadership to be able to uh, really influence how state regulations are set up and spending. And so we're, uh, we're lucky to be able to apply and we're lucky to have her uh, representing us at the state level. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple of items to uh, to speak about. On item 16 about the, the shelter crisis, um, I understand the concerns raised by members of the community. I do uh, recognize also the 82% uh, of the people who are homeless in Santa Cruz County who have no shelter. And uh, that these are thousands of people. Uh, and uh, we should need to be doing as much as we can to provide shelter uh, for people who are unhoused here in Santa Cruz County. Um, although this gives us some waiver on uh, uh, pieces of our code, you should be assured that anything in which the county is involved in is going to make sure that it's safe, that it's reasonable for the people who are there, and provides a better opportunity for them than living in the trees uh, by the creek beds and other places here in Santa Cruz County. So it's a very important issue, and, and we have to take big steps to address the, the number of people unhoused here in Santa Cruz. On item number 25, I want to thank the Health Services Agency for uh, bringing this item about student loan repayments uh, for people who are working in healthcare in our clinics. I think this is uh, really critical to making sure that we have quality staff and that we make sure that the people who are doing that public sector, public health work um, uh, uh, can help get their uh, loan uh, repayments made. So I know we approved this earlier. This is just approving this one, but thank you to Health Services. Um, also on item number 27, uh, I'm glad to see that we're making uh, progress. Sometimes it seems slow on the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust Initiative. Uh, it, this is a, a really critical uh, piece that could really help us break down the silos that often separate us. Um, uh, and sharing information that could help out individual community members and the community as a whole. And I just want to encourage to keep on uh, pushing hard uh, to get this up and running because I think it could have a, a great impact on Santa Cruz County. Uh, on item number 29, I want to thank the Parks Department for their ongoing efforts and advocacy to identify funding for the uh, um, Heart of Soquel or the Soquel Creek Linear Parkway. Um, uh, Park staff has done incredible work, uh, and as we were out there uh, last Thursday for uh, Soquel Family Movie Night, you realize what a great resource we have that right in the heart of Soquel, uh, and I appreciate the efforts by staff to help make that plan uh, become real. Lastly, on item number 32, uh, the update about the winter storms, uh, it is helpful to have this information. I appreciate uh, the work by our staff. Uh, and the advocacy uh, trying to get these projects completed. I know it takes a while. Um, I'm hoping that in future uh, um, 
reports, we can also get some idea of target dates of when constructions might start with a big asterisk that you understand that, that, that it's an estimate because there are a lot of other pieces involved there. Uh, I've uh, checked in with staff or my staff has checked in w with uh, public works staff to find out uh, when projects might start. Uh, it's really helpful for us to have that information. Uh, but I appreciate the ongoing work and the difference that it's already made um, in fixing the roads damaged by the 2017 storms. That's it. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, a couple items I'd like to briefly uh, discuss. Item 17, which uh, I brought forward, I wanted to thank the CAO and the Planning Department for their work uh, with me on this in order to consider a three-year pilot program to reduce uh, or actually eliminate some of these fees for ADUs, for small ADUs. Uh, it, it would cost about 7500 uh, a unit on the county for this. We pay, in some cases, about a quarter of a million dollars in subsidy unit for affordable housing uh, apartment developments. And so if this can incent uh, any kind of small unit development within our community, I think it would be A, faster, and B, a lot more cost effective than uh, what we currently do. And, and it's uh, in looking throughout the state, uh, while other communities have looked to ways to reduce fees for ADUs, this actual program seems to be unique in the state, and I think that this is something that we should be proud of that we're moving forward with. Uh, I'll share my colleagues' compliments to Ms. Timberlake on item 28, and also I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Coonerty for his leadership on this item. He's been, uh, and his staff, both Allison and Rachel and his staff, have been working very hard to ensure that Thrive by Three succeed, and they are a strong advocates for uh, Young, the youngest in our community. On item 32, I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Machado and Mr. Wiesner for your work, uh, and also note that uh, the financial impact that you mentioned uh, on item 32 doesn't mention the element that uh, a lot of these funds on the local match will come from SB1, which is under uh, threat with Prop 6. So just to note that, that uh, the timeline is what it is, but if we lose the funding on the local match, the timeline will slip, and we need to ensure that we have that local funding uh, because there's a lot of storm damage still in all of our districts and in some parts of our district that are still limiting access down to one lane or less in areas where people live and we've got an upcoming winter. So these, it's essential that we continue to have the funding streams that we have uh, and losing it would be very problematic. So that's all for the consent agenda. Uh, we have uh, a request for additional direction on 23. Is there a motion with that additional direction? So, so moved the uh, consent agenda with the uh, amendments. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty with additional direction on item 23. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously with uh, Supervisor McPherson. Absent Supervisor McPherson is, is uh, with his family today. Nothing's wrong. He's just had a, a travel thing that he needed to do with his family today, but so he regrets not being able to be here today. We'll move on to the regular agenda. Uh, these are items that we did consider last week, but there was additional direction on them uh, from Supervisor Leopold, so we've decided to continue the items to today. That's item six. Bear with me as I have to reread the item, which is to consider ordinance amending chapters 1.01, 06, 08, 2.02, 03, 04, 06, 10, 12, 18, 24, 40, 42, 45, 54, 56, 58, 60, 64, 70, and 78, 80, 90, 92, 96, 2.117, 121, 122, and 124 of the Santa Cruz County Code to address miscellaneous code provisions, correct typographical errors, and update agency titles and statutory re references to return and the next available agenda for final adoption as outlined in the memo of the County Council. We do have the ordinance and the code updates for all of these in the strikeout and underlines. Mr. Heath, welcome back. Good morning, Board. Jason Heath with County Council's office. Um, last week we brought this item to you. It is part of our county code update project. Uh, you instructed us to go back and change, make a couple of changes to uh, uh, the gender pronouns. Uh, we've done that work and uh, now we're returning with the ordinance. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about this item. Are there any uh, questions? Thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for your request last week. Do you have any update to that comment? No, I would just uh, thank the staff for uh, taking the time to, to review this and making sure that we're in, as inclusive as possible. Um, and uh, I was over the weekend I was with um, a, a therapist who does a lot of work with the transgender community. Uh, and when I shared what we were doing, the, the appreciation was, was great because they recognized the um, 
all the different ways in which there are barriers in language and, and other actions uh, uh, to people who don't uh, register as binary in terms of their, uh, uh, their gender identity. So thank you for that. Any other comments from board members? We will open it up for the community. This is on item six. Does anybody have any uh, comments on item six on the regular agenda? Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I spoke about this issue before you, when these were all um, before you last time, and again want to point out that the changes in wording that really critically restrict the uh, duties and purview of the County Water Advisory Commission is more than just changing grammatical misspelling errors. It really changes what they, what their role is. The annual County Water Report is a substantial document. It is a compendium for the, the state of the water in this county. And three of the five of you sit on a board for one or sometimes both of the um, groundwater sustainability committee boards for our county, the Mid-County Groundwater and the Santa Margarita Groundwater, which I happen to notice both of you were missing from at the board meeting. And I really think that we, we, can't, we can't have this kind of change that gets just read off summarily in a string of numbers. It's not transparent to the public that there are very critical changes being made. At least in this commission, that's the only one that, that stuck out at me because I go to those meetings when I can. But, but to remove a very critical piece of the ability of a citizen oversight group to be able to weigh in on content and implementation of the county's annual water report, I think is a disservice to the public. And I did have a an email exchange with uh, Mr. John Ricker. He does not agree with me, but there are many in the water community that do. So I would like to ask that you pull that particular change from your approval today and bring it before um, a wider body, perhaps the Mid-County Groundwater, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, and get their take on it. Because this is a big change. It's not just a change in a typo or a punctuation. It is limiting the purview. And I also want to speak that in terms of the Historic Resources Commission, I also go to those meetings and they have no minutes other than action minutes. So there is no record for people to see the decisions that they actually make. They are not recorded. I pay someone to come and video record them and put them up on YouTube. But this commission is making serious uh, decisions as to bulldozing our county historic resources. And I ask you to pull that one as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on item six? Marilyn Garrett, I uh, concur with uh, Becky Steinbrunner and urge you to pull those uh, two sections. And it seems like often we say, oh, things are minor changes, they're typos, we're streamlining. And what you're actually doing so often as with what you've done with the consent agenda uh, and not letting the public speak and someone asks you to pull it, you don't pull the item, is you're streamlining the public out of any discussion or decision making. These are important changes, and you've got such a lengthy list. Uh, um, anyway, what I, I've seen over the years is more and more decisions are being made behind closed doors. Therefore, 
in the interests of corporations and money interests like the Svensson Project developers, and it doesn't, and it's not really in the interests of the, the public. These are, uh, I just say, what semblance of democracy there is, is being more and more diminished. And your obligation is to protect the public health and well-being. And what Becky just brought up and previous policies seem to be going the other way. It's uh, very disheartening and not what people have elected you to do, as I see it. Anybody else like to address us on item six? Uh, Supervisor Leopold, we'll close that and bring it back to the board. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think, the, uh, I appreciate the comments by members of the public, but I think it should be clear to the public who might be listening that the changes made for the Water Advisory Commission are, are not more restrictive, they're more explanatory. Uh, and it, and the, 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 the slight change in the wording does not limit what they do. Uh, it actually casts it more broadly, in my opinion. And you should also know that the, the county uh, uh, coordinating with uh, LAFCO and water agencies has been actually trying to highlight and promote um, our water report uh, over the last couple of years with public events so people could better understand what's going on around water. The county also participates, as was mentioned, in two uh, advisory groups uh, uh, formed out of the the Groundwater Sustainability Act. Uh, even though we do not uh, control any water systems, we participate in these and pay to participate in these and are represented by uh, some members uh, of this board uh, to participate. And their goal is actually to do public outreach and to better inform people about uh, water issues. So I think the, the, the County of Santa Cruz is doing a lot uh, to better inform the public, engage the public, um, and the Water Advisory uh, Commission is one of the tools in which we use. Um, I support these changes, and I would move the recommended actions uh, on this item. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Before we go to that vote, uh, Mr. Heath, last week you had asked whether the, I just want to make sure you have the clarity, you'd asked whether the board wanted them to come back this way. Do you feel that you have clarity moving forward on future uh, modifications for process? Uh, y yes, I'm going to continue doing it the same way. Um, uh, if it ever becomes problematic, um, the way this is being presented, just let me know and I, I can do it a different way. I expect to bring another ordinance to you next month along the same line. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously with Supervisor McPherson absent. That's actually all the items that we have on today's agenda. I'd like to thank uh, Community TV for covering and we will see you uh, back here on October 2nd.